Welcome to this webinar, How Material Specification Can Help Achieve Net Zero Targets, which is held by, by a building magazine in association with ACOM. I'm Thomas Lane, the technical editor of Building Magazine. Construction is one of the biggest contributors to carbon emissions, accounting for 28% of global emissions. As buildings get more energy efficient in use, the contribution from the materials to construct the building becomes proportionately more significant. This can be as much as 70% over the building's lifetime. Clients are now setting ambitious net zero carbon targets for their projects. The Greater London Council now requires project teams to submit whole life carbon calculations for large projects. And there are now calls for new building regulations to control embodied carbon in buildings. Material choices are a critical part of this equation. In this session, our panel of experts will look at how to reduce the carbon impacts of the materials used in construction. This includes using less materials, specifying those of less embodied carbon, including low carbon steel and concrete, and the impacts of material choices on well-being. We'll also be covering reusing materials too. So today I'm joined by Jack Brunton, who is a Principal Engineer of Structural Engineering at ACOM, Saria Jones, Structural Design Manager at Len Lease, and Amber Luscombe, who is an architect and well-accredited professional with architect Mora and Lorraine. So the running, the basically the, the format for today is each panelist will speak for up to about 10 minutes. And then once the formal presentations are over, we will take questions from you, the audience. And I encourage you to submit your questions. You can submit them during the presentations if you like or at the end, and we'll endeavor to answer as many of these as possible. So um, today, Saria will speak first, and she's going to cover Len Lisa's net zero carbon strategy, which is to achieve absolute zero by 2040 with no carbon offsetting. And she'll talk about how the business is moving towards this target. Jack is going to talk about the carbon impacts of structural frames, including the use of low carbon steel and concrete and the need for carbon transparency. Amber will discuss the challenges architects are facing in getting materials which are net zero and also the impacts of those choices on um, well-being. So um, without further ado, over to our first speaker, who is Saria um, Nandi. So um, over to you, Saria. Thanks, Thomas. Um, I will just try and share my screen. This is where I struggle. Right. Can you see that? I, I can. Yes, that's, that's yeah. great. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. So um, thank you, first of all, for um, inviting me on today. Um, as we all know, the role of material specification is becoming more and more important while we're all trying to get to our for us, absolute zero targets. Um, I'm Saria Jones, I'm a structures design manager and I, I work for Len Lease. We're a global real estate company. Um, we have urbanization regeneration projects in a lot of the major gateway cities across the world. And for us, building really sustainable cities is, is, is really part of that. What's really important for me is that we're an end-to-end -end property business. So we sit in investment, development, construction and asset management and how that's proving to be really useful in our um, strive to, to get to zero is that we know what we are delivering, what we can purchase out in the market, and we can use that information on those materials to inform our decisions and our whole life carbon assessments at investment and development stages. Um, three years ago, Len Lease um, announced our global targets for mission zero. And there's, there's two parts of it, but the one I'm going to really focus on is we are saying that we want to get to absolute zero carbon emissions from our business by 2040 and we're saying that we're not going to rely on on offsets for that. Why that's really important is it's really focusing everyone's minds. To get to zero by 2040 is obviously a huge challenge and it's, it's getting everyone from our business from construction managers, commercial um, managers, project directors all looking at how we can unpick some of the barriers that may have previously occurred when we're trying to get to that net zero um, solution. 
we spent about three years going out into the market, talking to our supply chain, talking to our consultants, being part of industry groups to try and understand what we can do to deliver absolute zero carbon. And in 2020, we, we produced a, a roadmap to that. In 2019, we looked across our whole business to understand where are the emissions in our business. And as you can see on that left-hand side, about 80% of the emissions are associated with the materials we use in construction. And the predominant ones are the, are the key, um, the key in, um, materials there are concrete, steel, aluminium and glass. So that really focused our attention on these are the materials that we need to get to know better. We need to understand our supply chain. We need to understand what we need to do to deliver lower embodied carbon materials. And this is where I think material specification is really key. Material specification on a basic level is really important because that's our mechanism to match and deliver our design aspirations. So when Jack is going to talk about later, when his design teams are coming up with solutions, our construction teams need to know that we can buy the materials to deliver on those solutions. What we're finding is that we're starting to use embodied carbon of a product using environmental de product declarations as a better measure um, of our materials than just talking about recycled content. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but the same products with the same recycled content can vary significantly in their embodied carbon depending on how they're processed um, and um, brought out. What that's also doing is it's starting to incentivize decarbonization throughout the industry, because wh while we're starting to put in those embodied carbon factors in our specifications, some materials are starting to become less competitive and, and in some cases non-compliant. And I think what industry has been needing for a while is a signal that if they produce these lower embodied carbon materials, we will buy it. Um, and us and other developers and um, design teams putting these into our specifications or really gives them that signal that they know that someone's gonna buy this. And then as we're finding, as, as embodied carbon is getting pushed even further, the value of circularity becomes really important. Something we're really working on at the moment is unlocking using reclaimed steel in, um, in our development and, and unlocking some of the previous challenges we had with different parts of the industry working in silos. So joining the dots between demolition, testing, fabrication and, and building. And again, coming back to the fact that we're an end-to-end -end user, that really helps us to unlock some of those barriers. Of course, we can't do this alone. Um, and what's been brilliant over the last few years is all these different groups that Lendlease is part of, and, and I'm sure many of the people on this call are part of, all working towards these same goals. And, and it's creating relationships um, where we can start looking as, a, as an industry at how we can better tackle some of the challenges we've got ahead. And to show you how important material specification is, what we're doing a lot at the moment is looking at projects that have already been through design. They're probably in stage three and stage four. And we're, we're going through and we're saying, looking at every single material and working out, can we source a better material? Can we upgrade that specification and deliver a lower embodied carbon building? And so, for example, on this building, it's a central London office, which has a business as usual case of 817 kilograms per meter squared GIA, which is fine, but not brilliant. And just by looking at some of the kind of options that we know we have from our supply chain, we can have a moderate scenario where we're delivering 30% reduction for the same cost and um, program. And then we're looking at, can we look at stretch and innovation targets where we're probably tapping into either new materials available or we're starting to talk about program or cost implications. And some of the things that might feed into that um, are looking at aluminium. So uh, Elephant Park, we've used, uh, we've tended our lowest carbon facade to date, um, and that's 140 tons of aluminium, which is at least 75% recycled content. A lesson that we learned there that is that that 75% recycled content wasn't enough of a specification and actually we need to put in our maximum embodied carbon factor for that aluminium. Another thing we're doing a lot of is we're starting to specify higher strength steel for our columns in, in tall steel frame buildings because that gives us both tonnage savings, allows us to tap into electric arc furnace and, and better electric arc furnace or steels um, and reduce that embodied carbon factor and often we're now finding it's, it's providing a cost saving too. 
when we're talking about this, um, I think it's always useful to, to give some specifics and some case studies. Um, here we had a kind of a retrospective look at a project that was designed um, three years ago, um, before we really even knew what we were talking about in terms of embodied carbon. And, and it's going through construction now. So what we wanted to do was look back and say, was our LCA right? If we replace the database values we used there with what we know we've actually bought from the environmental product declarations, what does that look like? And even though most of it's bought, are there still opportunities to improve? What we found, so on the left-hand side is the reinforcing steel embodied carbon of the um, steel that was bought on this project. Um, the LCA had assumed a very low number, around 0.5, and the blue bars there show the embodied carbon, so that's the kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilogram of the steel that we bought. The, the key thing here was we had assumed the same um, embodied carbon for the post-tension strand as the reinforcement, and you can see there what we actually bought in the post-tension strand significantly outweighed that. And the impact that had on our project was it added about 30 kilograms per meter squared GIA. Um, and if you think about the LCA for this building, it was, it was just on, it was sub 600. So that's quite a big impact. The good news was that despite not even talking about embodied carbon on this project, the concrete mixes that we used were optimized already for, for their um, place in the building. And we were delivering a saving on the embodied carbon that had been assumed in the LCA. And then that's using our knowledge of being able to, to directly calculate the embodied carbon of each mix. And what that did was provide a saving of about 60 kilograms per meter squared GIA. Now we know structures are about 60% of the overall embodied carbon of a frame, but let's not forget all the other bits that go into a building. And what we're learning is we shouldn't just focus on the big ticket items, every single bit that goes into a building needs to be honed down and improved. So finishes account for 10 to 15% of this building. Um, and the impact of the raised access flooring and your suspended ceiling can be significant just by changing that specification. So for example, from an aluminium ceiling to a steel option. And what that meant was you, you add that all together and despite increasing the embodied carbon, because of the reinforcement and an increase in steel tonnage, we still can find opportunities to reduce the embodied carbon of this building through our future purchasing of fit out. The other thing that this is kind of highlighting is that that element I talked about before about signaling demand. So we've got a, an opportunity here where we're saying we know what we're buying currently and we can base our LCAs, our life cycle assessments, on what we are buying currently, but actually are there better products out in the market that maybe we can't currently get to, but can we work to, to purchase them and then putting them in the UK market? So the, the items in green are um, environmental product declarations that are out there that have lower embodied carbon um, properties for the reinforcing and post-tension strands, but are currently not available via our normal UK supply chain. So we're signaling a demand for that lower embodied carbon material, and we're looking at ways of unlocking purchasing those. So in summary, but the way I see it is material specification really will drive the future of net zero. Um, once we've done the amazing work with our consultants of using less material, making sure we're refurbishing as much, we really need to start talking about how we're gonna source well. Um, we need to push the boundaries, Talking about it in more detail and putting them in our specifications allows the supply chain to know what we want to buy and start investing in providing that. And also then it starts talking and um, leading to us to really focus on circularity, making sure we're using materials that we know we can use again more in the future. So that's the, a summary of where we're at. We've got a long way to go, but what's really exciting is that in the last three years, we've come so far and the industry is really gaining momentum. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Saria. Um, just before we move on to our next presenter, just a quick question. I mean, Len Lease, Lease is sort of unusual amongst developers in that you have got a kind of contracting arm, haven't you? And you mentioned the end to end yeah. supply chain. I mean, do you think it's a bigger challenge for other developers who, you know, use third party contractors rather than having their own in house team to achieve these sorts of um, targets? Well, really, the developers are setting those targets and we, we are having to deliver. So we also work for external 
um, clients too. But by setting that bar high, everyone is having to, to work to deliver that. Um, so I, I think that where we can bring something useful is those initial assessments and those assumptions. But I think the developers, even without contracting arms, have a huge role in, in setting those targets. Great, thanks very much. So we're now going to move on to our next speaker, who is Jack Brunson from ACOM, who's going to talk about structural frames. So over to you, Jack. Okay, hoping everyone can see that. Um, say that again, sorry, Tom. Sorry. Yes, we can, we can see your screen, it's looking good. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, hello everyone, my name is Jack Brenton. I'm a Principal Structural Engineer um, working for ACOM. My background is very much in um, structural engineering, but in the last few years I've been sort of more involved from the embodied carbon side. Um, so I think just for starting, it's really important to, to highlight what our, um, our, our role and responsibility is with, with uh, regards to embodied carbon um, compared to um, your, your, your average person walking down the street, our impact is, is massive. So as strict engineers, we are responsible for around, for around 2,000 tonnes of CO2 uh, per year, uh, which is equivalent to 430 gasoline-powered passenger vehicles driven for one year, or 2,400 2, acres of US forests in one year. So you can see there that we have an unusual amount of power almost <laughs> around this subject. Um, I'm a, a vegan, um, and part of the reason why I went vegan originally is because of the, the environmental aspect of that. Um, but by going down that route, you're saving probably one, uh, one tonne of CO2 per year, so it just sort of gives you a, a flavour for, for the impact that we have as, as engineers. So, in terms of having to um, reduce embodied carbon, my, my colleague Adam Parks um, settled on this, this strategy, which revolves around the rule of six, which is for refurbish, reuse, quantify, specify, detail, and optimize. Now, this is very similar to the, the past 2080 hierarchy for uh, embodied carbon reduction, which is mainly build nothing, build less, build clever, build efficiently. But this just adds another level of granularity to it. And you can see within this, uh, this rule of six, at the bottom there, we have specify and uh, the role of, of, of low carbon specifications. So, as I said, this is something from an embodied carbon point of view that I've been involved with over the last few years. And, and one of the biggest roles that I've had is, is, is as co author of the Eco Zero tool. So, the, the Eco Zero is a conceptual design tool uh, which allows us to basically design 11 different structural typologies um, in the full frame including the floor plate vertical structure foundations basements transfer structures if you if you have them um, based on some input geometry um, in terms of like things like column spacing there's a num uh, number of bays in either direction story heights uh, number of stories etc um, it basically puts the conceptual design against those and then it, it calculates uh, material quantities and that allows us then to quantify uh, the cost um, associated with those quants and also the embodied carbon as well. So what it is is a really useful tool for you to assess the impacts of different design levers or measures that you, that you make. So here you can see uh, a graph which is a plot of a conceptual study that we undertook and it was basically a, around a, an eight or nine storey office um, building with a, a single storey basement. And you can see left to right on the bottom, you, you've effectively got your, your baseline um, and then we, we use the tool to remove the basement and add, add an additional storey. Um, we then reduce column grids, um, we remove the transfer deck, uh, we re we reduced the number of stories to favour a, a squat construction, so rather than eight or nine stories, we were down at, at four stories. Um, and then also we have low carbon materials specified. So that was a very sort of blunt. Okay, let's switch from BOF um, steel to EAF, and also just 
upping the amount of cement replacement that we were having. So you can see there that the, for a new building, um, low carbon um, specifications is part of a, a bigger piece. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk mainly around um, low carbon steel and, and low carbon concrete, chiefly because they're, they're the most impactful uh, on the industry at the moment. Obviously, we, we, we do champion the use of, of timber on projects and things like uh, round earth slope stabilization in favor of things like uh, concrete retaining walls. I'll start with, with, with steel. So steel making, uh, steel making using current commercial technology is carbon intensive. Globally, steel production accounts for around 8% of all um, greenhouse gases. Um, but steel is the most, uh, is, is also the most recycled material with excellent circular economy credentials. Um, today, uh, steel making is dominated by two production processes, which is the, the blast furnace, uh, basic oxygen furnace, and electric arc furnace. So the split between the two production uh, processes is circa 80-20 uh, BOF to EAF in the UK, closer to 60-40 uh, in Europe. So both BOF and EAF uh, methods use version and recycled material, but in, in different percentages. And the green credit associated with EAF is generally more, more favourable uh, than BOF due to the the less amount of energy necessary and for the higher input of scrap steel against raw inputs. Um, however, relying um, on EAF production means assuming that there is an infinite amount of steel scrap available in the market any time, um, which would therefore make it unavailable um, for other projects on a global scale. So the message really is that we, we shouldn't be um, specifying EAF um, uh, products only on our projects because it's it, it doesn't really address address the issue um, when we when we think of it as a whole. So there's a, a sort of guide that's been put together by the, the Steel Zero Group, which is um, something that's very referred to earlier on. It's not Acom, a member. There's a uh, Mesa in there and, and, and Landis amongst others. Um, but what they what they are basically um, suggesting is that we specify or, or stop 50% of the, the steel. So on the writing aspects, we request 50% of the steel requirement by 2030 is to be responsible steel, certified steel, steel produced by a steel making site where the site's corporate owner has a medium term quantitative science based uh, global um, greenhouse gas emissions target for the corporation or low embodied carbon steel with a defined specific emissions intensity, which takes into account the portion of end life scrap. So to, to support um, our specifications, there's um, the NSSS um, specification for building construction that has re is releasing Annex J. Um, and what this does is just support and give guidance. So it suggests that we uh, require all relevant EPDs um, to be submitted by, by fabricators, um, gives further guidance on steel procurement, project specification requirements in terms of sustainability and reusing structural steel. So this is just a really important guide for us to go, and, go away and use. So moving on to uh, concrete. Um, so cement as a component of concrete is said to be responsible for around 7% annual global CO2 emissions. Um, so what I've sort of tracked out here is, is where we are now, what we might be looking at in terms of technologies in the medium term and then long term. So I sort of mentioned before that um, maybe we, we shouldn't be just specifying EAF on our, um, on our projects basically because it doesn't look at the whole picture so well. And I think the same can be said for GGBS. Um, cement replacement on a project. So GGBS is a, um, is a byproduct of BOF steel uh, construction. But I think we all know, at least in the UK, that it's, it's, it's quite difficult to come by at the moment. So specifying it on your project isn't necessarily um, helpful overall, especially if it's having to be imported from, say, Holland or Germany, which we, we do see that happening. And then you've also got the bottom there, uh, PFA, which has been used to good effect, but it's, it's a byproduct of um, 
of the coal uh, of, of uh, fossil fuel power plants, etc. So looking at moving away from um, these two cement replacement groups, you can see there that I've, in the, uh, the four hexagons at the top, you've got alternative cement replacements such as alkali activated cementitious materials, calcine clay cement, which we're very ex excited about at ACOM, and then geopolymer cement. So these new products may not generally fit into the prescriptive um, standard framework for traditional concrete, such as uh, BSDN uh, 1997 um, and BS8500. So while many of the tests and considerations relevant to traditional concretes and common cements may be broadly applied to these technologies, some of the test details do not, and this may impede the use of AA of use of these technologies and existing standards are specified for, for a project acting as a barrier to innovation. So I know that there, there are uh, updates coming for uh, BSA 500 in the, in the short term, I think to cover um, limes, limestone blends. Uh, and then beyond that, it will then be looking to, to, to cover these, these new technologies. In, in the long term, um, there's a lot of really good work that's being done in the industry, not least by, by um, Hansen, who has set a, a long-term strategy um, towards uh, 2050 and net zero. So rather than just focusing on, on different cement replacements and such, they're, they're looking at drastically reducing uh, the carbon impact of, of both EAF and uh, BOF processes. So that might be you're using things like hydrogen, um, hydrogen biomass and plasma te technologies, um, using carbon capture um, al alongside uh, basically maybe filling in the, the voids underneath the, the North Sea effectively with, with, with carbon. This that will be then further aided by uh, the decarbonisation of the, the national grid as well. Just in, in the centre there, there's a couple of medium term items that I've, I've pushed past a little bit, which was uh, the smart crush technology. So that's recycling um, existing concrete and retrieving the, the cement from it. And then also carbon curing, which I think is a, again a technology a lot of people are excited about. You have companies like Aramco beginning to, to use it in, in KSA. And also you have um, Carbon Cure who are working on the Clippers uh, Stadium at the moment in, in the US. So I think, I think generally the point to say is that yes, uh, material specs are, are really important, but we need to be wary of using them. Um, with the graph that I showed at the start, we, we can get towards achieving the LETI 2030 target already before we even trying to um, use some replacement and, and, and load low carbon steel. Um, there's a few contributors to this uh, presentation that I'd like to thank. Andy Avery, who's associate materials engineer at ACOM, Adam Parks, uh, my colleague I, I think I spoke about earlier in terms of his role with EcoZero, and then also the ACOM, Lon ACOM London and SC Net Zero Task Force. Thank you. Great. great. Um, thanks very much for that, Jack. And um, Again, a quick question for you before we move on to our last presenter. Um, I mean, you mentioned your um, trajectory towards reducing embodied carbon in, in structural frames, and included in there were removing the base and also using um, smaller structural grids, which sounds great in practice and principle. But how is that going to our clients? Are they embracing, happy to embrace it, or are you getting pushed back? So. I can give an, an example of one of the projects I'm working on in, in East London at the moment, and it's, um, it's it's a scheme that I was involved with um, from around 2017 to 2019 um, for a new School of Business Management, and it went into planning, and unfortunately uh, that planning was refused, um, basically due to the, the loss of a, a, a locally listed building. Um, going back to that project, we, fortunately we were, we were uh, appointed again um, for a new scheme. And we were able to go back, look at our old um, design, and then quantify the embodied carbon impact of that. We then sort of used that rule of six to, 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 to interrogate those designs and look for savings. So, so one of them, for example, is that we had a nine meter column grid at one end of the building. Um, and that was really just going to be used for office, office use. And we were able to demonstrate that if you reduce to um, a six meter column grid, um, you, you can massively reduce your, your carbon impact. So we 
we, we found that they're also working with the architects on the project, but there wasn't really any impact on 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 the um, the flexibility of the floor plate uh, with that approach. So we, what we were able to demonstrate is um, via by having a larger basement on the new scheme, we demonstrated a, a 1,000 ton CO2e uh, reduction based on all of those um, of applying those principles of, of carbon reduction. Great. And, and the client loved it. And also, <laughs> there was a um, an article that we we wrote alongside Building Magazine a few maybe a month ago or so, which is around low carbon frames. And and the the, the message there is that these frames aren't more expensive. If you are doing things like reducing concrete, they, they tend to be reducing um, reducing material quantities and as such reducing cost. Right, I see. That's really interesting. Well, thanks very much, Jack. We'll come back to you again in the Q&A. Um, but first, we have our last presentation, um, who is from Amber Luscombe, who is an architect with Lorraine, uh, Morrow and Lorraine. She's going to talk about the challenges facing architects when it comes to reducing the carbon impacts of materials. Thank you, Amber. Thank you very much. Um, really honoured to be here today um, and sort of along such great panellists as well. Um, so as Tom said, I'm an architect. Um, I'm also a well AP and I focus a lot on office refurbishments in central London um, with a, that focus on healthy materials, specifically well-being and also incorporating nature based solutions. Uh, so fitting in at m and really proud to be part of a practice which, as you can see on the screen there, this is something we um, really try and practice by um, and we have sustainability at our core, uh, which drives decisions made um, and is embedded within the whole practice. So those six on the screen there, uh, reducing whole life carbon, promoting circularity, benefiting biodiversity, improving well-being, creating social value and designing for longevity and obviously really important topics um, and obviously still focusing on materials uh, but these are inextricably linked and um, we try to design with all of these in mind. So uh, to start off, where are we starting from? And I think uh, the other panellists have already um, or touched on these really important figures, but I'm going to just reiterate it. So materials account for 11% of global greenhouse gas emissions, the other 28% being the um, operational emissions. And that's um, really important because actually as operational emissions go down due to uh, grid decarbonisation, more efficient systems, the materials materials, the proportion of materials impact will actually be increasing. And obviously the buildings we're designing right now uh, will be having PC in say five years or so. So we need to act right now to make sure that those materials, um, as the others have spoken about, are getting as close to absolute zero as possible. So how do we do that? Um, whilst Jack has spoken about the, uh, the structures specifically, I wanted to go into a little bit more detail, uh, a bit more of a micro scale and talk about um, more than just the structures of the buildings, which is obviously incredibly important. So whilst uh, the, the best low carbon option would be to just create empty boxes, obviously we use, our, we, we use the materials as architects to create communities, create great spaces for people to live and work in, building brands and, um, well, and uh, yeah, so creating those communities. Um, so how do we actually reduce our impact whilst doing all of those things? So first of all, the first question we ask as architects uh, is to build less. Uh, can you take an existing building? Can we enhance it? Can we extend it um, rather than demolishing? That shouldn't be um, the starting point. And then at uh, the sort of more micro scale, down to even material specification of modules and sizes, such as tile specification, plasterboard specification, reducing waste on site, and also using BIM modeling and using the technologies available uh, to ensure we're as accurate as possible to reduce that waste on site. Building local, I'm going to touch on this later um, because uh, where the materials come from and the transport is such a massive part of that embodied carbon of the materials we're specifying. Um, then with building wise, using modular principles, uh, a lot of off-site construction to reduce waste, uh, designing with modularity for efficiency is really important um, in, in reducing our 
embodied carbon impact and also looking at uh, designing for disassembly uh, the term long life loose fit I'm sure a lot of people are aware of of so with office fit outs you're typically looking at a refurbishment every say five to ten years how can we design buildings to be easily disassembled whether that's for an internal fit out or whether that's to turn it into a new use so building with uh, the lifetime of the building in mind which leads me on to building circular uh, we've talked a lot uh, in the other panels about um, recycled content of materials and using epds to inform our material specifications so um, I don't know the particular figures, but at Mario Lorraine, we um, try to use as much recycled content and um, make sure that EPDs are reflecting that. Uh, so that's from reclaimed timber flooring to recycled content of tiles um, and other surfaces in the building, and also making sure those materials are easy to recycle at end of life um, and the component parts can be disassembled. Which brings me on to building natural. Um, as a generalisation, the less process that a material goes through, the easier it is to um, recycle and reuse at the end of life. Um, so, and natural materials in themselves, the process takes carbon, it takes um, energy to create those processes. So we always advocate building with as natural materials as possible. And that's important for the environment, obviously, but that's also important for people. And people account for 90% um, of uh, businesses' operating costs. So it's really important to keep your people happy and healthy within your buildings, as well as um, the impact on the environment. So just a quick graphic there showing that actually it's 90% people, 9% um, energy costs and about um, rental costs and about 1% energy costs in your business. So why is that important with um, material specification? Well, there was a Harvard study done um, in 2015 that looked at uh, two office spaces, one with average levels of VOCs. So VOCs are volatile organic compounds. They are emitted from highly processed products, which goes back to that build a natural point. So things like MDF emit formaldehyde, acrylic paints, other highly processed products. So they had an office with average levels of VOCs, which you'd find in your typical office, and they had an office with better qualities um, of VOCs. And there was a reported 61% increase in cognitive function in new employees with the cleaner air. And I think that really speaks for itself in how much impact materials can also have on the people in those spaces. And that can be taken even further. Um, a similar study was carried out, and they actually quantified that per employee in uh, the improved indoor air quality, there was actually a £4,700 increase uh, for that particular company, um, and that was back in 2010. So um, really important to make sure that not only are the materials we're specifying are good for the environment and are getting to absolute zero, but actually we're thinking about the people and the businesses as well. And I. To sort of reiterate that point and give us a sort of real world example, a particular product we've started using a lot and will be using a lot more is the use of clay plaster. Um, typically, we would go for a gypsum plaster with acrylic painted finish. Um, the graph in the middle there is actually showing the difference between these two products. So the product is Clayworks. It's a pigmented clay plaster, um, which is uh, they're based in Cornwall. And actually, for every meter squared of clay works that you use in comparison to a typical finish, you're actually saving half a kilogram of CO2 per meter squared. And yes, that's um, you've got a much bigger impact of your your building frame, your steel and your concrete. But as Saria said, it's honing every single detail and your finishes across an entire building. And this can be used for walls and ceilings. Um, obviously also makes a massive impact on the scheme. Going back to the building local point, uh, the graph on the right there shows the A1 to A3 um, calculation for a kilogram of the Clayworks product. And it's actually the transport that has the biggest impact. So I think that's really interesting that you could have a really low embodied carbon product in itself, but actually the transport is such a massive part of that when you get into the detail. So 
just to summarise on the sort of architect's perspective of getting to net zero, there are six areas I think we really need to work hard in. Um, and the first is really accepting that accepting the challenge. Uh, we're not going to get to absolute zero without uh, with, without some sort of challenge and, and some change in the industry. And it's about accepting those new ideas and new technologies. And even over the last few years, I'm sure you've all seen the um, emergence of great new products. And um, again, as Saria said, it's about signaling to the industry that we want to work with those companies and we want to install those products uh, and specify those products. And that comes with knowledge sharing, that sharing between these new technologies and the specifying team between us and the clients and educating our clients um, and also across projects. We're all trying to get to uh, to reduce the global um, greenhouse gas emissions. We need to be sharing between um, between companies and projects as well. And finally, um, just on the building itself, I've talked a lot about future flexibility, about the need to um, ensure the buildings we are designing are working as hard as possible um, and making sure they're not using products which are impacting people negatively. And for example, um, buildings that might have sick building syndrome need to be uh, have materials changed. We want to make sure we're making the best decisions at the outset. And finally, a point that um, is a whole other topic in itself uh, is the use of materials and using what we have already, another sort of trendier term being urban mining. Um, so how can we actually get those products from different sites uh, with sort of the use of material passports and things as well? And I think that's an area where uh, we are looking specifically. So just to summarise then, for us as architects, it's about getting to zero and not using um, offsetting. So how can we get those materials down? How can we reduce the embodied carbon? But also the instant benefits of doing that for, you, for people, for the businesses and for the places we work in as well. So thank you and I'll hand back to Tom. Great, well thanks very much Amber. Um, so just a quick, again, quick question for you before we move on to the Q&A session. Um, I had a few people coming in asking about sort of the cost differences, capital cost differences between say, clay plaster and a gypsum plaster so that'd be good to know your thoughts on that but also what do you do where you've got a, um, a partition wall and you might use plasterboard and um, stud work how do you deal with that when it, I'm assuming that clay plaster has to go on a solid substrate uh, so I'll answer the second one first uh, clay works can just go onto plasterboard uh, it's a clay plaster just works like a normal plaster so uh, you could still have your typical stud work and plasterboard um, Obviously, I think just to preempt any other questions on, obviously, as architects, a lot of the time we just tape and joint and then paint over the top. But um, when looking at uh, the uh, inventory of embodied carbon, uh, there's actually still uh, the use of clay pigmented clay pasta is better than using acrylic paint, say three coats of acrylic paint. Um, and there's the facts and figures that can be found in that. It's actually interesting for waterborne paint, which is um, sometimes used as a sort of more sustainable alternative as a generalisation can actually be worse sometimes. So it's always worth checking those EPDs um, and the content. On to your first question about cost difference. Yes, clay plaster is more expensive um, than a typical paint finish and obviously please go to Clayworks and speak to them um, about that, uh, about your project. But um, I think, firstly, clay plaster is an incredible um, the finish you get as an architect, just as an aesthetic finish. It's far superior than anything you get with paint. So I think the cost is completely justified. And I think it's also largely about what are the benefits you're getting. Yes, it's a bigger cost in the short term, but in the long term, you're for example, improving the VOCs for your staff, you're getting more productivity out of your staff, you're feeling healthier, um, you prefer being in that space. So I think there's other cost benefits, even if there's a bigger initial outlay. Great, thanks very much. Um, so now we're going to do some general questions. So if everyone would like to turn on their cameras um, and microphones, and then we can sort of start the, um, the ball rolling. Um, so the first thing I really want to talk about is um, EPDs, environmental product declarations, which come from manufacturers. I mean, I guess, I mean, I'm interested to know um, 
you know, from, our, from our panelists how much you use these, but also how many products have them. And that I think Tom has frozen, but um, <laughs> whilst he's unfreezing himself, I will just quickly jump in with that in case anyone else wants to answer. So as architects, we use EPDs as much as possible uh, when we're specifying. Um, and like you said, it is sometimes you are constrained with who you can go with because um, EPDs, I've, as I understand, cost quite a lot of money to produce. So newer companies or startups might not have the capability to produce those EPDs, which sometimes is a shame that we can't use those products in that instance. But yeah, it's something that it's incredibly useful resource for us and then helps us do our uh, life, uh, sort of our one-click LCA, our embodied carbon assessments on that. And um, anyone, sorry, I, I think I froze. I, I heard I'm receiving, but I heard the whole question. Um, but um, how about um, Jack and Saria? I mean, do, I mean, what role do yeah, from, EPDs play review, review? From our point of view, EPDs are, are, are crucial. Like as we identified, um, we can have some, for example, with the reinforcement, they can all have more than 97% recycled content, but we can have a huge variation in, in your body carbon to do with that. And, and that's us challenging database values. So, so that's become really critical going forward when we're really pushing the boundaries. Um, and, and for most major construction projects, I think most of the supply chain understand that importance and the number of EPDs is gaining momentum every day. And do, I mean, is, I mean, I've got a question just just coming about um, building services where, where there aren't very many EPDs. I mean, I think SIBSI, do SIBSI use do produce guidance? Do you use that? Yes, yeah, so SIBSI's produced the TM fifty something. Um, services aren't my expertise. Um, so that's that's been really good to start the ball rolling. Um, there are things we can do, and we've been doing ourselves is using our knowledge from the structures side to to get the actual um, component numbers. So, for example, steel cable trays, trunking, etc. We we do know the embodied carbon associated with those materials, so we we can start doing some early calculations on that impact as well um, as the industry is is gaining that knowledge. Great, thanks. I think it's. It I'm not a building services engineer, but I have some view over this. Is that um, we were looking on one click the other day, and it seems that most of the EPDs um, associated with, with plant are, are come from France and maybe Germany. And I'd sort of wonder a little bit if that's linked to um, the, the, the mandates on, on reducing body carbon that, that, are, that are present in France, in Belgium as well, they're not yet in, in force in the UK. Things like that are, are going to drive the, the production of the EPDs. Right, that's an interesting part. I think we'll kind of come on to that one in a second. But before we get to that regulation side, I want you to get to the bit in the middle, which is life cycle analysis. Um, I mean, one of the questions that one of our questions is asking that there seems to be no consistent way of doing a whole life carbon calculation, and that people are all doing it their own way. Is that is that your experience? You have your own sort of ways of doing this, or are standards merging? <laughs> I go first. Um, so, so as Lendlease, we have spent a bit of time to at least get a um, baseline across all of our projects and developments where uh, we've created a whole life carbon brief, drawing on on, on the different um, guidelines out there um, to it to allow us to at least assess our, our projects um, consistently. Um, I don't know if Jack's got something. Yeah, I mean, at, at ACOM, um, we've got sustainability consultants that are using one click, and I think typically everyone is moving towards towards one click. But I, I think alongside that, it's, it's really important to sort of note the, the biggest savings that you can make on your projects from the project's inception. And you, it's, it's important to quantify those, but do we need to do that in such a way that it's, it's, it's sort of standardised across the um, across the industry, or should we just be trying to reduce? Carbon impact as, as best we can, and you can do that using tools like the IEEE um, Carbon Calculator, which has been obviously really, really useful to everyone, and it's accessible to everyone. Like if you're using one click, the, the licenses are expensive <laughs> and also difficult to, 
to get hold of as well. So I think it's just an important thing to note, really. Right, right. And um, Amber, is, is this an issue for you, the sort of tools for whole life carbon calculations? Uh, yeah, so we're the same as Jack. We use One Click LCA. Um, we use it. Um, we have a license in house, so we use it from sort of really concepts, using it at really high level, and then we use it to drill down into the detail later later stages as well. And I think that's the best way we can find to um, to assess it, which is um, which is based on the you know the standards across the industry. Um, but as with all tools, there's always, you know, issues of um, comparison as well. There's been, I mean, there's been quite a few calls from sort of certain um, some people for, um, I think it's new part Z, which is to um, regulate the embodied carbon. And Jack, you mentioned how in France, um, sort of regulations around embodied carbon are actually driving manufacturers to EPDs, I guess it'd be quite a kind of virtuous circle, couldn't you really? I mean, is this something we should be doing here? I think, I think certainly, yeah. I mean, historically, you know, when you back in the 90s and 2000s and so forth, I mean, it, it, the operational carbon was seen to be more, more of an impact on projects compared to embodied carbon. Um, but with the, the decarbonisation of the, of the national grid and, and also um, you know, the, the improvements in technology in that field, just embodied carbon becomes more and more important. If you're going to hit those those targets for 2050, then really the, we need to be um, mandating certain carbon uh, reductions from an embodied point of view, not just not just an operational carbon. And do you, I mean, how about um, Amber and Surya? I mean, do you think sort of in regulation is the answer here, or are we not there yet? <laughs> A hundred percent. I think it's, um, you know, we need to, it's, it's levelling out the playing field and making sure that we're all, um, you know, without using too many cliches, like singing from the same thing sheet about it. Because, um, like Saria was saying already, but you look at recycled content of a product and then the EPD, it can be completely different, or completely varying. So um, I think regulation, uh, as with everything, is the way to go. Um, you know, it's the same with building sort of, I'll bring it, I'm going to bring it onto well because that's, <laughs> that's what I always do. But you know, we always, there's certification, that's great, but there's no real, um, everyone's going to do the minimum at the end of the day unless there's real sort of drive behind it. So increasing the minimum standards, I think, is a really good place to yeah, and I think Thomas, you mentioned earlier about how the GLA requiring people to publish whole life carbon assessments. We've definitely seen in, in the London market that's made a really big difference because suddenly mm -hmm. you're able to compare different projects. You've got a number you can talk about and that's driving the innate competitive nature that we all have um, and, and driving those discussions about how to reduce it further. So we've, we've definitely seen benefits to that in the London market. That's really interesting. I mean, I mean, based on, you know, if you can see those whole life assessments, I mean, you see someone that's just got some amazingly low figures, let's say. I mean, is, that, is there a culture of openness? If you were to go to, say, I don't know, a competitor, and they've got some really low figure, to ask them how they're doing that and sharing their kind of experiences. Um, I found that, yes, there is, because cause there is an understanding between the whole industry that what we knew six months ago might be different today um, and we can all learn from each other um, what we found is that you can really um, work together and understand and going back to Jack's um, point about the one click LCA one, one of my big challenges is really we need to know what if you put rubbish input in you're going to get rubbish input out and, and we need to know that we're able to buy that um, and not just base things on, on database values. And I think that's where it's useful for all of us to talk to each other and make sure we're all starting from the same baseline. We all understand our markets and our suppliers really well. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, some of you mentioned reusing materials. I you know, Sue, in your presentation, you, you mentioned, you know, two, two areas where um, ceilings and um, flooring. And I, I visited a project a while ago called um, Entopia in Cambridge, where they're actually reusing raised excess flooring. Um, and I don't know whether this is something you've um, sort of looked at. Um, 
maybe that's something that you would have raised, but obviously there are issues around A, getting hold of it, but B, warranties and that kind of thing. So yeah, so we are currently looking at that on, for quite a few projects. It, it seems like an easy win because you get these steel panels, which basically don't have a lot of impact to them. Um, and you sort out ones that are quite obviously damaged and, and you can reuse it again. Steel doesn't really degrade in quality as we go on and we can test it. So so that is a really a, a good win. I think one of the challenges we've maybe had going forward is perception. And, and there are some tenants who want something brand new. If you're going into a brand new building, you want brand new products. So that's something that we're working through. On the structural steel side, I think that's less of an issue because um, people don't really have a perception about the frame of their building. They just get the frame. Um, and as long as we're satisfying all the, the kind of code requ requirements, we can get it UK CA marked and, and warranted, um, then those number of barriers are actually reducing quite rapidly. And, and that's what we've been finding is just making sure that we're all together working through it with the steel fabricators, the testers, the demolition contractors. Um, and what you need is that constant chain of custody. So, so we need to be able to, join the dots and I think historically the challenge has been is those different people work in silos so a demolition contractor doesn't have a route to a steel fabricator but what we can do is we can join those dots now right right I see yeah no that's that's interesting I mean you, you mentioned raised access flooring and structural steel but are there other areas which are kind of like a quick way in terms of reuse rather than um... yeah I mean a lot of a lot of suppliers are now looking at take back schemes um for, for ceilings raised access floors and um, even we're talking about in, in Australia we're looking at things with servicing where we, we have take back schemes as well so I think the future may be that a lot of the materials in your building you don't actually own um, and, and you actually just transfer. Right and um, Jack on the sort of issue of reusing structural steel I mean, because it's such a big contributor to the, the footprint of the building where you just framed um, I mean, are you sort of now working with approaches which make it easier to reclaim that, recycle that steel, those steel um, elements? So, you know, for example, composite flat frames, they have um, welded studs, which then kind of, you end up with the concrete floor slabs for those trays all kind of, you know, essentially folded together. I mean, it's now, I think, talk about using bolts, bolted studs, shear studs, that make it easy to disassemble. Are you looking at those what those little kind of, little things actually can make quite a big difference in how easy it is to reuse a structural frame? Uh, yeah, that's it. I mean, it, there's a company called Pico who have done some really um, quite impressive things around uh, mechanical connectors for things like precast elements in, in favour of like grouted in traditional, um, traditional approaches which obviously just um, complicate um, the, the extraction of those those elements at the at the end of life um, for sure I mean in, in terms of design for deconstruction generally I have some points prepared, <laughs> which is again it's just starting with favoring the use of mechanical and non-destructive connections um, ensuring that the the number and complexity of disassembly steps are reduced so that's things like making your your, your structural frame um, as as simple as possible um it, so you know at the end of life you're not having to deal with some massive long tr um, transfer structure for example just because you think about the, the backpropping that would be be involved um with that sort of approach um specifying elements and parts of the standardized specifications to um, establish a consistent stock. So if you've got some similar columns, um, perhaps you can standardise standardise those so that it can be reused in the future and it's, it's a standard stock. And then the other thing is to use um, specified components and constituent parts that are made of homogeneous materials, so the same materials uh, or materials mutually compatible with the recycling process. So, so avoiding having sort of glued or, or grouted up um, construction types. Great, thanks. We're actually pretty well out of time. It's, it's, it's an hour now, and time's really kind of rushed past, and we could talk about this all day, I think, but um, unfortunately we can't. But so I'd like to sort of say thanks very much to our um, speakers and to um, say that the webinar will be available on demand to download if you wanted to see it again. Um, 
and um, thanks everybody um, for listening today. Great, thank you. Thank you thanks very much. All. Thank you.